Our next speaker today is uh, Dr. Krastubanev. He's assistant professor uh, of theology at Durham, Durham University. His research interest includes classical rhetorical theory and Christian preteaching. He also has been investigating the theological responses to the Balkan Wars and uh, World War II, one, sorry. So uh, he will be speaking today about the grace of God doesn't take away freedom on the relevance of monastic literature for education on case of San Siobhan de Afanit. Please. Am I using this one? Or this? Can you hear me? Okay, it's working, the magic. Thank you. It's a privilege and a joy to be here. Спасибо. Я очень рад, что я здесь. Христос воскрес. The grace of God does not take away freedom. This is a quotation from the writings of Saint Siloan of Mount Athos. Today I will be speaking on the relevance of monastic literature like the writings of Saint Siluan for education. And I will also begin with a story. Children and politicians setting out the problem. I begin by telling you of my first experience of speaking in a school context. It was a few years ago. I was visiting a very special village in Romania. What made the place unique was the presence of several hundred children. They were orphans. Many of them saved from abortion. The orphanage was established immediately after the collapse of communism, 1989 in Romania. Its founder is the local Orthodox priest, the priest of the village. His name is Father Nicolae Tanase, who together with his wife Maria took the first unwanted newborn babies direct from the hospital into their own family home. My visit to their village coincided with that of a group of pupils from one of the best high schools in Bucharest, the capital city of Romania. The contrast I observed could not have been greater. The high school pupils were confident and articulate. Many of them spoke excellent English and had numerous questions about the university system in England. How do I apply to study? Are there any scholarships to help me with the tuition fees, etc.? The children from the orphanage, on the other hand, had no such aspirations. I spent most of my time with them at the so-called Casa Americana. This was a large house constructed with donations received from American benefactors. There were 13 girls living there, aged from 2 to 17 years old. And only one of them spoke English. It was with her help that we could communicate. There were no questions about education in England. What these children needed was much more basic. Just someone to play with, as my host, who introduced me to them, explained. And so I spent my day, I had only one day there, looking at picture books, running around with the little ones, holding hands with two of them as they took me around their yard to show me their animals, cats, dogs, and geese, has remained as one of my most cherished memory. Despite these huge, obvious, and quite to be expected differences between the two groups of children, there was one striking similarity which I noticed in the remarks some of the older ones made when speaking about life in present-day Romania. They all 
had no trust in the political leadership of their country. None of them could imagine ever becoming a politician. When I asked why, they just kept shaking their heads to indicate their aversion to the prospect of a political career in general without being able to give specific reasons for rejecting it. A close relationship of trust clearly existed among the members of these two groups, facilitating their common striving towards the good in the old philosophical sense. One could describe both groups as one closely knit learning community in which the rejection of politics was even more striking as it was expressed with a quasi-religious feeling. So what I witnessed was the emergence of a spontaneous value judgment. All the children were in agreement on where to draw the moral border between good and evil. And all of them simultaneously chose to stand together in opposition to the evil they perceived in politics. The emotional charge that characterized this feeling towards the current leadership of their country was that of despair. The opposite of hope, which brings me to the theme of our conference. We are gathered today to address the topic of hope in the context of education. To these two terms, I have added a third one, leadership, political leadership. The connection between these three, education, hope, and leadership, was first made explicit in classical antiquity by authors such as Plato or Cicero. And it was on these ancient philosophical and rhetorical roots that Christian thinkers such as John Chrysostom or Augustine eventually developed their own understanding of how education prepares the leaders for the future. In our workshop, we'll have the opportunity to discuss further the process by which the educational theories of classical writers were taken over and transformed by early Christianity and how much relevance there could be in that for us today. But now, in this talk, looking at my experience at the orphanage, I want to ask myself some questions. Questions which I did not have the possibility at the time to discuss with my Romanian hosts and which I would like to explore a little further with you today. These I will group under two headings, problems and solutions, which will provide the structure to what I have to say to share with you today. So we begin with some problems and then we look at possible solutions. Firstly, then the problems this critical stand on the part of the Romanian children falls within the lines of the classical Greco-Roman tradition which expected of the ideal leader to be first, I quote, a good person and then an expert in speaking. Good person, expert in communicating, in speaking. In Latin it ran vir bonus, dicendi peritus. Goodness before expertise. In our society today, if in our society today we see a lack of clarity on this point, as the children indicated, what are the main reasons for it? Where does this problem come from? And is it at all possible for a modern educational project to reconnect personal integrity goodness and political leadership, expertise in communicating in leadership in a way that matches this ancient ideal. That's for problems and this is what I'll talk about in the first part. And secondly, in the latter part of the talk on solutions, since our meeting takes place under the auspices of the School of St. John the Theologian, the ego here, which similarly to the orphanage in Romania, is explicit about its orthodox roots. We may also ask what an orthodox version of this reconstruction may look like. If the orthodox ethos is to be a key ingredient, how are we to define it? 
and I will discuss this second issue, the Orthodox contribution, by looking at the writings of Saint Silwan. But first, we begin with the problems on the narcissism or on the narcissistic corruption in the world. Professor Papadopoulos ended his lecture with encouraging us to get out of our narrow, narcissistic, and hedonistic perspective, if I got the quote correctly. So I pick up from here. Narcissism as a problem. My trip to Romania took place in 2014, two years after the German psychoanalyst Hans Joachim Maas published a book, a groundbreaking work, entitled The Narcissistic Society, in German, Die Narzisstische Gesellschaft, published in Munich in 2012. I mention him because his perspective has helped me a great deal with my thinking on the relationship between personal integrity and leadership. Maas had worked as a clinical psychologist, first under communism in the former German Democratic Republic, and then in the reunited capitalist Germany. For him, the desire for more, good, more goods and services, a desire which is the driving force behind modern Western consumerism, is much more than just a manifestation of personal avarice. He claims, that's the central claim of Maas's book, is that our society as a whole suffers from a narcissistic psychological disorder. In keeping with the mainstream psycho psychoanalytical tradition, Maas defined narcissism with reference to the ancient Greek myth of the young Narcissus who fell in love with his own reflection. The condition can exist, Maas clarified, in a good, healthy form, as well as in a bad, unhealthy one. The good narcissist is someone who has healthy self-love, love for the self, whose identity is secure, and who, as a result, is able to love others as himself. And this German psychoanalyst does explicitly quote the New Testament here, to love others as himself. Maas defined this love as the capacity, and I quote him, the capacity of being in the full sense of the word next to another person. And while leaving them free to understand them and to accept them as they really are, not as they should be. End of the quotation. At the opposite end of the spectrum stands the narcissist who suffers from a permanent urge to seek recognition, to be loved at all costs. The resulting hyperactivity, busy, very busy, is a form, Maas argues, of self-defense to compensate for the insufficient love on the part of the parents, and in particular the mother, for their infant child. People who, people who suffer from this disorder live of a false kind of hope. They strive, hoping to make up for the deficits they feel in their soul through the acquisition of external and ever more diverse material goods or forms of power over people. I want to refer you here to a film which in English has the title Despicable Me. It's one of my children's favorite and also mine. I'm told the third one is about twins. I'm, I've got a twin brother, so I want to look, I'm looking forward to watching The Despicable Me 3. But as you know very well, in that film, the hero, Felonius Gru, even plans to steal the moon in order to get his mother's recognition. So a film built on narcissism. The most, case, the most obvious cases of this bad type of narcissism, according to Maas, are those of leaders in different position, different positions of authority. Here belong, above all, company managers, stars of the entertainment industry, and significantly, for our case, he names politicians. Recent German history provided him with poignant examples of unhealthy narcissism in the case, for example, of the last leader of the German Democratic Republic, Erich Honecker, or of the West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, 
for Mars, Helmut Kohl was, and I quote him, a super narcissist, ein ober narzisst who put his career above everything else, and this attitude, as well known, eventually led to the suicide of his wife. So the problem, narcissism. Where to look at Knowing where to locate the problem is halfway to finding a solution. The cure which Mars recommended could come about by nothing short of a reformation, of a revolution on the level of the inner self. And the slogan he offered for this revolution was, Narcissism should not be allowed access to power. This, of course, did not mean that leadership as such was to be abolished but rather transformed from within. It's not a question of not having leaders at all, but of, a, of the leaders themselves being different kind of people who do not have this unhealthy narcissism. So the desired outcome was that only good narcissists take up leadership positions. The consequences for society of this radical change, so Mars argued, would be no less significant than those of the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Just as outer democracy could come only after the abolishment of political dictatorship, so inner freedom, inner freedom could only exist in a person who is free from unhealthy narcissism, from the tyranny of this unhealthy narcissism. So I could have discussed this with my Romanian hosts, but there were also other points besides Mars's analysis of the danger of narcissism, which I could have raised with the Romanian children. One of these concerns method, methodology, or the way in which we acquire knowledge and skills. And here I could have directed the children to a parallel which I perceived between their refusal to consider a political career and the traditional Christian rejection of abortion. I mention this because for my Romanian interlocutors, the conviction that politics, politicians, could not be role models for the younger generation clearly belonged to a set of doctrines with similar binding force as that of the prohibition against abortion in the earliest Christian and later Orthodox reflection on ethical issues. Thus, for example, an early second century Christian document known as the Teaching of the Apostles explicitly stated in the second chapter, you shall not murder, quoting the Old Testament, you shall not procure abortion, nor commit infanticide. The orphanage where I met with the children is registered as a non-governmental organization under the name Association Pro Vita, for all, born and unborn. Its charitable activity is made possible by the support it receives from churches and pro-life groups from all over the world. Given this context and the orthodox background of the majority of the pupils, presenting them with the conclusions of a learned doctor would have appeared as offering them yet another authoritative statement or bullet point on their list of important facts to learn. I could imagine some of them writing their revision cards for an exam with the following keywords, abortion equals sin, politics equals narcissism. These equations would have been a dogma in the ancient sense of the term, a point of fact that is that has to be taught and learned, or translated in the jargon of modern day educationalists, the reasons against abortion or political career could be listed as learning objectives to be delivered during a lesson and tested in the exam afterwards. Searching for possible solutions to this problem, I skip a paragraph. The problem of narcissism, that is, and whether it has to be taught as how we teach that abortion is a sin, for example, in a Christian context. I now want to turn in the second part of the lecture to an orthodox contribution from St. Siloan, and the quote I chose for this is, the grace of God does not take away freedom. So in what follows, I'll look briefly at the theology of one of the more contemporary saints of the Orthodox Church, Siluan the Athanite. My aim is to give an outline of a partial facet of the general Orthodox ethos, which for our purposes today, I will define as living with hope. And I will focus on Siluan's understanding of how God acts as a teacher who never violates our freedom. This is a theology which could be called a theology of reversed hierarchy. God is a teacher, and yet he does not violate our freedom. And this can provide us 
with a theoretical base on which to carry out our struggle against narcissism. So Saint Siloan understood hope as a key characteristic of authentic Christian living. It was for him more than simply a fixed point of belief, a chapter as it were in a big book of dogmatic theology. On the contrary, hope possessed a dynamic quality. Hope served as criterion of truth and in this sense was always required. To remain hopeful as a Christian did not mean, however, closing one's eyes to the pain and brokenness in oneself or in the world. St. Siloan's key phrase, keep your mind and despair not, in this phrase, hell can have many meanings. And one of the possible interpretations present in the writings of Siloan concerns all who are ignorant or unaware of God's presence. And this is why he repeatedly prayed that all nations of the earth may come to know the Lord in the Holy Spirit. So Siloan often compared humanity to children lacking in knowledge and therefore in need of further instruction. Such is the content behind one of his most frequent affirmations, your spirit gave me to know you. Ignorance on our part was for him one of the basic facts of life and needed to be approached honestly and realistically. His call was for all humanity to learn to stand before God as before a generous teacher in frank confession of our limitations, but also in hope. Hope in the Holy Spirit as the only one who can offer the teaching that we need. I skip a paragraph. Here we must pause for reflection and consider a paradox in Siluan's vision. The Orthodox Church affirms, both in, his, in its dogmatics and in its prayer, that the Holy Spirit is sovereign, everywhere pres present, and filling all things. The Spirit is thus understood as both an agent of God and fully divine in His own rank, equal with the Father and the Son. Various symbols are used to describe the Spirit's activity, such as fire, wind, or water, all of which capture one essential quality, freedom. Yet for Siluan, the Holy Spirit was ineffective before beyond the border where our freedom begins. The authority of the teacher did not go beyond the pupil's ability to choose what teaching to receive. The educational task in which God involves humanity, in other words, required a reversal of the natural hierarchy. God, the Creator, in the beginning, had restricted His own freedom by giving humanity the gift of freedom. And God, the Teacher, in continuing to educate every new generation, carried on doing the same, not forcing our will, but leaving space for our own freedom. The grace of God, as Siluan put it, does not take away freedom. In this dynamic, God remains in command without, however, needing any forced love or recognition on the part of His creatures. God is not an over narcissist. His acts, first as creator and then as teacher, are grounded in His freedom, which in both cases He chooses to restrict. So imagine God sort of having inner freedom to do whatever He likes, but he restricts that both in creating the world and in how he relates to us as a teacher. And we can add to this how Christ, out of his own free will, chose to limit himself and accepted, accepted death. So St. Siloan's reflections on how God acts as a teacher requires us to pause for reflection. The teacher-pupil relationship he envisaged is one in which God does not rely on the use of any force. It was only in a free teaching arrangement, so to speak, that the most sublime of all lessons, namely that of love, and in particular Siluan speaks of the love of the enemy, could be communicated. We live today in an age where, at least in all developed countries, children of school age are legally obliged to be in full-time education. Restricting their freedom in this way, we make education not an option, but a fact, perhaps, perhaps the fact of their life. God, on the other hand, in Siluan's vision, while being available to all, compels no one. So this is the paradox. We live in a world full of narcissism and there is no such thing in God. And talking about orthodox contribution, I want to sum up what I have just said about Siluan's vision and how that can help us with an educational project. So in conclusion, a few remarks. Siluan's vision of how God by limiting his own freedom, teaches love and freedom, should present all of us with a challenge. 
we may well have to accept that we will never be able to institutionalize this kind of freedom in our schools or in our societies. I know Leo Tolstoy tried to do this in Russia. While this is certainly true, there is still a place, not an institution, but a place available to each one of us where we can allow this freedom to reign. It is in our innermost selves, in our hearts and in our minds. There it is possible for us as parents and teachers. And there we need to become free. This is, of course, a difficult task. But we all, parents and teachers alike, must be prepared to undertake it. Otherwise, our capacity to act freely without any narcissism-driven motivation on our part, this capacity remains very limited. So I am in agreement here with the affirmation of Orthodox theologians like Father Vasilius Termos that the acquisition of this inner freedom inner freedom can be defined as a common aim of both orthodox spiritual guidance and psychotherapy. So this lecture today was one in which I tried to combine these two perspectives, psychotherapy and orthodox spirituality. For Hans Joachim Maas, on the one hand, hope for the future lies in the possibility we have, both as individuals and as societies, to begin in earnest with the task of educating ourselves and the upcoming generations to recognize and avoid the dangerous sides of both unhealthy narcissism. In an educational context where the spiritual legacy of the Orthodox Church is taken seriously, further work can be done to equip us with a solid theological and ethical motivation for the task at hand. And in the second part of the lecture, I spoke of Silwan's vision, where only a teacher who is himself free or herself free can teach freedom in the children by God. This is not something that can be learned in one session, in one lesson, like one learns facts of history. Rather, it's a new type of skill that can only be acquired in a relationship. The paradox here is that the teacher, in order to be successful, needs to accept that there are limits beyond which the freedom of the pupil is sovereign. So in concluding, I wish to stress this central conviction that the acquisition of inner freedom on the part of teachers and parents is our guarantee, our hope, that our lives and our educational efforts will serve a purpose in breaking the chain of narcissistic corruption in the world. The acquisition of inner freedom on our part will serve the purpose of breaking the chain of narcissistic corruption in the world. Born of inner freedom, education will facilitate on the part of both teachers and pupils, the recognition of how sublime the task of leadership can be when leadership is freed from the narcissistic disease. So, Maas, the psychologist, summarized this by saying, narcissism should not be allowed access to power. On the orthodox side, the positive view was expressed, captured in the most famous saying attributed to one of the most beloved Orthodox saints, Seraphim of Sarov. Acquire peace and thousands around you will be saved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krasta. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, um, I think what you propose is, is um, something quite important. And uh, I, I guess I was going to ask, how do you uh, see um, a kind of new type of leadership that can be um, nourished, uh, nurtured through maybe, um, well, we can call it, you know, orthodox approach to education um, or the approach to education which is based on, on the principles which, which you laid out. Maybe just in, in like three words. <laughs> yes, um, thank you very much. So I, I started in a sense, um, very abstractly talking about St. Siloan's understanding of how God, or in particular the Holy Spirit, acts as a teacher without forcing anything. And then 
I basically said that this is a challenge for us because in many ways our educational systems compel, compel the pupils to do things. And the children adapt to this compulsion by thinking they have to do what is expected of them. Pass exams and so on. So our whole system creates this narcissistic disorder where we have satisfaction because the children are doing what we're asking them to do and they get recognition because they think they're doing what we want them to do. And so neither we nor the children are able to really understand who they really are and who we really are. So this is a challenge. I do not think that we can solve it in one day or with one, one lesson, so to speak. And I know Professor Papadopoulos is here. He will have so much more of his experience to speak about this. It is something that remains with us a bit like the tasks that uh, the previous speaker was talking about. Every day we, we learn. Every day we learn. So in two words, not education, but manuduction. So that's two Latin words, both difficult to translate. In German, Erziehung und Beziehung. So the difference between, in a sense, pumping you with data or the opposite leading you by the hand is not so much about teaching but about a relationship. If we have now established that from this theology of Saint Siloan, the only way that God creates in us free people is by Himself remaining free and standing in a relationship with humanity free from any kind of narcissistic-driven motivation. That means that we as teachers and parents have to really strive in that way to be God-like in this freedom. Many Orthodox theologians speak that when we talk of humanity being in the image of God, that's pointing to freedom. God Himself is free, and when we are created, so says the Bible, as His image and likeness, the gift that he gives to us is freedom. And yet, this is something that we only learn in a relationship. It's not a fact that you can learn from a maths book. You have to learn it in a relationship. But the problem with relationships, whether parent and child or teacher and pupil or husband and wife, is that these relationships are often tinted. A bit like when you eat a sandwich on the beach and you get sand in your mouth and that sand ruins the taste of the whole sandwich. Often our relationships are never free from these projections we have for other people or for ourselves and false expectations because we haven't really got to know who we ourselves are. So Basil the Great in the fourth century has a homily on this ancient Greek as well as in the, in the scriptures saying know yourself. So I think that what is the solution, the orthodox solution? There isn't one. It's a constant striving. Striving that begins with us, ourselves first. Which is why I quoted at the end Saint Seraphim, who basically reverses this idea. Most people think they will lead the world, they will save the world, they will change the world. You start a new job, you know exactly what to do, and you tell your colleagues how much they're wrong in what they're doing and so on. But the point, the, the finger is pointed towards you. Acquire first freedom in yourself, peace in yourself. And then this leadership will flow out of this fountain of freedom that you have. This is something John Chrysostom articulates in his homilies on priesthood, where he in particular attacks ambition. And he says that leaders who begin their jobs with ambition are starting on a wrong, wrong track. One has to be free from ambitions. But we live in a society that encourages us to be ambitious. This is something I would like to discuss with you because it's very important. I come from Bulgaria, Estonia, similar post-Soviet world. Um, our priorities as teachers have changed. In communist times, you had to fit in the group, so to speak. And now you're encouraged to be the individual who completely stands alone and sells, solves the problems of the world alone. And our educational systems, being part of two now very different societies, have to adapt. Whereas before the emphasis was on the group, now let's say the emphasis is on the individual. Every child is seen as an individual. And we try and help them grow as an individual. Before, the idea was to educate them as part of the group, whether from the Komsomol onwards. And how does this orthodox vision relate to these two social realities in which we find ourselves uh, after the change from communism to 
free democracy, if that's the right word for it, is something that I feel we could discuss further in this conference. Um, not for me to answer, but to learn from you what you yourselves think about this. Thank you very much. Thank you.